Welcome to New Zealand. Thank you for having us. Have you been here before? I've never been here before, but there's a, there's been a sort of a quiet yet noticeable exodus of a lot of my friends in the movie business who have sort of started to move over here. Hi. So to work in the movie industry or to do something completely uh, uh, different? I'm not sure. I think I think that pretending to work in the mu movie industry, but they're just happy to be here. Well, it's an amazing. It's an country. amazing country. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Do you have some time to see a little bit? Are you kidding me? No, you don't. <laughs> no, 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 I don't. Well, you have to come back. Exactly. But of course, you're here to um, give us. Yeah. What am a I doing here? <laughs> a beautiful show. I don't know. I hope so. Yeah. I, I, no, no. I absolutely. I mean, look. This is the the the, the whole. The thing that happened a couple of years ago to me was that a bunch of friends sat me down and said, okay, time to get out of the windowless room, time to go and stop hiding behind the screen, um, start looking your audience in the eye, you sort of owe it to them. Yeah. Um, and I'm going, but I'm terrified. I have stage fright. And they go, well, so does everybody else. Go, yeah. Get over yeah. it. You get know? over it. And you have, because you've been doing the show now for two years? Well, a year. A, a year. Oh, no, a no, year. but, and, and you know something? Yeah. The terror is still there. It's just, I know it's not going to kill me. And yeah. Well, that just, keeps just you, go out there. It keeps you on the edge and makes you perform the best you can. Well, you're supposed to be. Yeah. You know, you're supposed to. It's not supposed to be easy, yeah. you know? It's not supposed to be, I mean, what, what I'm really aware of is, this, you know, an audience puts down their hard-earned money. Life, life isn't simple these days, yeah. you know? And we better, we better deliver a show. We better deliver an experience. We better do our very, very best. Yeah. And of course, last week and the week before, you played it at Coachella. I know. So I mean, I mean, do people here know what Coachella is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the biggest festivals. Yeah, and it, it and it, it it truly was extraordinary. It, yeah. Because they didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect, and I sort of worked out that I don't think we ha we have the words. Because why would we have the words to describe what it feels like to have? to somehow include 50,000 people into the process of making music, yeah. as opposed to them out there and us on stage. It, you know, I mean, it feels like everybody's participating in creating an experience. Yeah, yeah. You don't and, really and it went down quite well. Yeah. So then, then, of course, I was terrified of the second weekend, you know, after reading <laughs> the press on the first <laughs> one. You know, paranoia yeah. is me. Was there a difference between the two uh, performances? Um, only in so far that we had, I suppose we had 90% of all the people there on the first one and we had everybody there on the second right, one. Right, right. You know, we um, got round and, yeah. Yeah, no, it went, it, it, honestly, it went great. That's as opposite as it gets to being in a room by yourself. Right, I mean, music. Th think about it, you know, for 30 years, it's just me in a room. And then, you know, when it gets incredibly tedious and I run off ideas, it's a lot, you know, yeah. get the musicians in yeah. and... Uh, go from there, but yeah. it's it's small, and it's and I am I'm not good at parties. I'm not good at speaking in front of people. Yeah. Um, so so I'm basically doing everything that I'm not good at. Yeah. You know, or that doesn't come naturally to yeah. me. But has it really been only you in a room? Because your list of collaborators is vast. Well, that, yeah. there are two reasons for that. One, mm. it well. First of all, every director is a collaborator. I mean, yeah. the way I, you know, I start with each project, I'm saying, okay, if you want me to do this, you better be a, be in the band. You know, you, right. I, I don't care if you cannot play anything, but just your voice, your storytelling, is you know, that's that's what I need. And mm. then, I love working with other musicians. I think, you know, coming sort of from a band history, basically, where. Um, I, th I think people don't really understand that one of the things you learn, you really learn as a musician, is to listen. It's much it, it, that's that's the emphasis, not the playing. It's the listening to other mm. people and being able to support them. Yeah. And it's it's just great when you get you know a, a Johnny Marr in or Pharrell or you know a James Newton Howard to just throw ideas around and yeah. play. Play you think, is the big word. You think here. they make you? perform or come up with 
better stuff than you would by yeah, yourself. Yeah, absolutely, because yeah. because there is ego involved, and it's as simple as that. That you know, there's a there's a void, there's a hole in a in, in you know, there's an idea missing. Yeah, and all of us are trying to just we're trying to be the one who fills. You know, I mean, I, I just remember working, you know, being in a room with Johnny Ma, Pharrell Williams, Junkie XL myself and we're, we're trying to write this track and first of all at one point I'm observing that Johnny Ma who after all was in the Smith which probably was one of the most downer bands you can think of <laughs> yeah. was sitting here opposite Pharrell Williams who had just written happy yeah and it all seemed to be going just fine yeah. but you know we were just throwing one idea after the other it was moving so fast yeah. and, and the ideas just coming and at one point Pharrell was going Stop, stop, stop. I think my head's exploding. I need to walk around the block. And he came, he walked around the block, came back with four pages of lyrics and ideas. Wow. Okay. So, but the great thing is that everybody knows to respect the other person's idea. Uh, in other words, you know, if, if I filled that void with something with a, with, a, with a few notes and Johnny comes up with something else, we all know what the better <laughs> you know, we all go for Johnny's idea. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it seems what defines your whole career and probably how you got started um, is a can-do attitude. And it's like, oh my God, I've got this. Actually, no, it's, it's the opposite. The it's opposite. interesting that you say that. Yeah. Um, because I'm just honest and candid and I'm going, wow, yes, it's a great story. I have no idea what to do. But, it's, but at least it starts a conversation. And somewhere yeah. during the conversation, like a tiny crack will open in the, you know, the impossibility of it, and some little idea will start forming. And uh, yeah, you know, and 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 that, that there's something interesting about all these projects because, look, I mean, if you look at the films that it was Ridley, Gladiator sounds very different from Black Hawk Down, sounds very different from Thelma Louise, sounds very different from Hannibal, sounds very different from Matchstick Men, a woefully underrated movie. Yeah. Um, but but, but do, you, do you mean, it's, it's like he himself, the filmmaker, is, is interested in so many different things. And so, yeah, no, it's, it's great, you know, going into this and not being limited by style or not being limited by, um, you know, some cookie cutter idea mm. that, you know, after Rain Man, I did a Ridley Scott action movie followed by Driving Miss Daisy in the same month. And well, that keeps you from doing the same thing over exactly. and over again. You know, yeah. and, and, and I think in the music biz world, you know, if you have a hit, you know, all everybody's hoping for is that you do something similar. Yeah. You know, and they don't understand that I'm still trying to do the country and western psychedelic heavy metal album. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So inspiration can come from anywhere, really. And, and inspiration yeah. comes from the storytelling, and inspiration comes from... I tell you what, where a lot of inspiration comes from. A lot of inspiration comes from the DP, from the way it's shot, the cinematographer. Right. Just the colors. You know? yeah. And a lot of inspiration comes from the, the director. Like Interstellar, uh, Chris and I actually sat down before starting anything, and we went through the list of the things we'd done on the Batman movie saw on Inception. Yeah. You know, big drums, uh, done that. Oh, big, you know, brass, Br gone, right? Done that, um, yes. Done that. So, so our list basically got down to woodwinds. And then Chris, you know, I'm going, I don't know what to do here. And Chris said, what about the pipe organ? And... Oh yeah, hadn't done that. Yeah. So that became, you know, so yes, by narrowing it all down, yeah. it actually became the voice of, of everything. Yeah, and it was a perfect choice. When I saw that film in cinema, I thought, wow, this is really refreshing. And, okay. and it felt absolutely right. I mean, you know, look, I can go on about this forever, but I mean, the, the idea, if you just look at a pipe organ, it looks like the afterburners on a yeah, 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 spaceship. Okay. Which pipe organ did you use for the film? The amazing one. It's um, Temple Church in London. Temple Church is the church that was built by the Knights Templars. Right. And it's, it's, an, it's an amazing place. It's right in the center of London, but it's where all the law courts are. Yeah. So 
there's no traffic around it. It's a it's a pedestrian zone because you try Perfect. to record yeah, anything London, anywhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My original idea was that we we're, we're going to schlep the orchestra out to Salisbury, eighty something miles every yeah. day, and there in the middle of London was this amazing place with this amazing musician. Wow, Roger Sayers. How old is that organ? Well, the organ itself isn't that old. Yeah. The church itself is, yeah. you know, is is. You know the expression for lawyers being called to the bar? Yeah. yeah. The bar th that that is describing is actually the altar in Temple Church. Right. So it's pretty, you oh, know, it, it has it, a bit of history. It, quite a I bit. I mean, <laughs> you know, because we had that place for, for ourselves for two weeks and you're going, oh, Shakespeare sat here. Ah. Elizabeth the first sat on one of those pews. Lots of things have happened. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the church in Da Vinci Code. Right. Right. So okay. that's why I knew we could go there because Ron had shot it yeah. there. So I'd been there. Yeah. So did you have um, the musical ideas already in place? Or I did was that all written. It was all written. All written. It was okay. Yeah. All, all, it was all written and I didn't think it was playable. Right. And on the plane ride over from Los Angeles to London, you know, I sort of took Chris aside and said, um, I know we're spending a lot of money here, etc. What would we settle for? You know, and, and we we sort of right. went, um, okay, if we if we just get some great notes out of the bass pipes, we'll we'll be happy, and the rest will be synthesizers or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then we met Roger, the organist, who, in typical English understatement, said, you know, well, I had a look at it, you know. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, why wouldn't I just go up to the organ loft and just yeah. try it out? And the man was, uh, I mean, uh, truly one of the most extraordinary musicians I ever met. And he just would, he would rip through this stuff yeah. like nobody's business. Yeah. And then when you, of course, sit in, in the hall and listen to it, it's pretty moving, isn't it? Yeah, not only that, but uh, uh, th there's a little video I saw of Chris and I talking to Roger up in the organ loft uh, for him to adjust his sound, and we wanted to have more bass, you know, go to those big, big um, pi uh, pipes. And you hear him change the sound, and suddenly on the video you hear nothing. Because, because too low. we're yeah. way too low. Yeah. And I put the orchestra into the church as well. Yeah. And so we, it was all beautifully mic'd, and one day there was a, there was a thunderstorm. Yeah. And so we got this. 3D 5.1, you name it, thunderstorm oh. with the ch whole church rattling. So, Fantastic. Which is actually yeah. in the movie. Perfect. I was going to ask that, yeah. And if yeah. you hadn't used it there, oh, you would no, no. use it in future, I'm it, sure. It was, it, it's in there. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of sounds, do you think um, with the way, especially action films, uh, action films have developed, like they're so heavy and reliant on special effects, um, has that had an impact on the music? Do you have to change the music um, because there's also sound effects, so many sound effects? And yeah, you know, and I, I work pretty closely with most of the, well, with all the sound effects, uh, you know, the sound designers. Um, and so, it, you know, it's binary, basically. You know, you go, oh, he's done, some, he's done a really good sound here, stay out of the way, yeah. or it's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and we are very... I, I mean, Interstellar is a good example because, in a funny way, we are the loudest movie ever and we're the quietest movie ever because we go to complete silence. Yeah. And Makes creating it complete yeah. silence is actually quite interesting. Yeah. Um, and there were just certain things, you know, because the, 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 the movie theater amplifies things tremendously and so you can't get away with certain things. The... Um, that there's one scene and it's just a solo piano and it took us a, actually quite a long time to record to get it noise free because the last thing you want to do is hear car horns in the middle yeah. of space. Yeah, yeah. I think Interstellar is probably in the recent films the odd one out because it's quite visionary I think um, in its terms of storytelling, yeah. special effects and, and yeah. the music but uh, like I don't know the Batman films that you've done it feels like well, we started, I believe we started something with the first one. We never thought there would be sequels. 
Right. Uh, no, we just, you know, we were just working on one movie and, mm. and we were just, you know, the, it was Chris's first big movie. I mean, yeah. it was his first sort of proper Hollywood movie. So, um, I don't know. I mean, we, you know, we, we, we felt any second now Warner Brothers is going to tell us to do it differently, but they were really supportive and really let us, I mean, down to that there is a fully fledged heroic superhero theme that we sort of kept, you know, we thought once the executives come in and tell us that, you know, all our crazy minimalist experimentation is sort of nonsense, we have one in the back pocket. Right. Yeah. But we never yeah. had to, we, we never yeah. used, had it turned into three movies. And for most people, it's three movies. But for us, it was 12 years. Yeah. So it's, it's worth remembering that yeah. time goes by and I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be cautious about how I say this but I mean it, it set a tone that then seemed to seep into many other people's movies Yeah. and then there came a certain point for me as well where I was going you know hang on a second enough of this you yeah. know like um, you keep repeating yourself yeah then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know um, so but, but because because you have to so uh, you know, you, you set the, the 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 first bat Batman begins is two notes, right? I mean, that was my motif, and so not knowing that I had to somehow make that stretch across twelve years and three <laughs> movies, you yeah. know, you you, you 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 know, you don't think about that at the time. Yeah, you know, I mean, Pirates is the same. You know, it's like um, it's still going, but. So when everybody was saying, well, why don't you actually have the courage to go and play in front of people, it seemed like, an, like a, the, the, the right time. And it's a good break from it all. Yeah. But, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's a good break to come back, having stood in front of an audience. The audience tells you things, not in words, but you feel it. You feel, you feel new ideas pouring at you from different cultures. And um, I mean, every every moment you play, every moment you play in front of people makes you a better musician in a way. For you and practice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always looking for the for the new, whatever that is. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. You know, yeah. just because it's new doesn't mean it's necessarily yeah. a good idea. But yeah. um, at least being out there now and being surrounded by these amazing musicians is. is Truly helpful. Yeah. So, who are they actually? Um, you musicians on stage, you have been working with them over the years, the, and um, the, the band, a small, insignificant unit of 20 musicians. <laughs> yeah, um, right. Little jam group. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. Look, they all played. Uh, you know, they've all been involved in most of the scores that I've done. You know, and then the orchestras. You know, in Los Angeles and in London, we obviously use the orchestras that I work with all the time. But then I know you have a pretty great orchestra here. Yeah. So, and, and that's that's the whole point. I mean, it, it's like you know, we might not have met before, but we'll play nice together. You know, yeah. and 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 then it's great for me to figure out to, to hear new players, to hear new orchestras. So a, so yes, on top of the twenty in the band, there's a there's an orchestra and a choir. Um, and in this case, here in New Zealand, they're all New yeah, Zealanders. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about how, how we're going to do this, and I was thinking about the way we experience a classical concert or most film music concerts, where you have a conductor and you have a bunch of people reading the paper. So you've got a guy yeah. with his back to you yeah. all night long. And I'm not sure how entertaining that is. Yeah. And, the, uh, and, and that's of my flippant response, but my real response is, I, I wanted to take down the wall that the conductor represents for me between the audience and having an autonomous relationship with the musicians on the stage. Yeah. Um, so I had a bit of a chat with all the players in the orchestra. Uh, you know, and I said, "Can we pull this off without a conductor?" And they were going, "Of course we can." You know. Um, yeah. The you know yes we rehearse. You know, yeah. and, and and we get it together then. But after that, you know, it's like and, an you, enormous you, chamber music. Group. Absolutely, yeah. exactly. And 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 that and that's the whole point of it, isn't yeah. it? Because it worked in yeah. 
the cha- it, it works in the chamber music tradition. It worked in the Baroque area, yeah. uh, era, and then suddenly in the 20th century we elevated the conductor to the superhero status. And since I yeah. don't want to really do any superhero movies at the moment, <laughs> don't you know, have it on stage either. I yeah. thought yeah. we'd get rid of that one too. Yeah. And and there is something great that happens when 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 it all comes together and you just feel the force of yeah. people directing one emotion like a laser beam at the audience. Yeah. So you're not actually acting as the band leader either. You are one of the musicians. I'm one of the musicians. I'm I, I I'm like the I'm I'm the I, I'm the I'm the weak link. <laughs> you know, every, everybody is a lot. But I mean, Guthrie Govan, this, this uh, truly, uh, I mean, this divine guitarist that I found, I mean, he's just, it, it, it's just extraordinary. I mean, I can go through every single one, but, you know, yeah. we'll be here for yeah. another couple of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. honestly, actually, I'm, I'm just realizing what I've done. I just did this. I'm a fan of each and every one of these musicians. And I just surrounded myself with all my favorite musicians and said, come on, let's, <laughs> let's Not go. many people can do that. Right. So. And, you know, Nick Lenny Smith, my, who is my musical director, I mean, I, I met Nick right out of school. You know, we right. started making music then. Andy Pasco plays double bass. I mean, him and I were, you know, we went bands in the 80s and we kept running into each other. So some, some people I've known for forever, some people... Some people have only done the la- movies in the last five years, let's say. Okay. And and some of it is multi-generational, where um, Johnny Ma can't do all the shows, but I know her son is a really good guitarist. So uh-huh. I said, so, oh, yeah. what about Niles? You know? And it's amazing, because he's got his dad's DNA. There's a certain sense of timing and style and playing. And when he started playing, you know, like the whole band shifts and it just becomes that. They get the vibe. Totally. Yeah. yeah.